Uh, we have a very interesting set of uh, presentations today. Um, we just had an excellent uh, colloquium at the ITC on uh, planet formation, what we know, what we don't know, and it's a very exciting topic from here. Uh, and the same is true about uh, our presentations at lunch. Uh, we hear from Andrea Dupre about the global classes, and the mystery continues, and then uh, from Vladimir Lyra, who gave the colloquium, the ITC colloquium, then from Yvette Sendes, um, that uh, will tell us about some interesting new data that was actually in the Gazette I saw, so congratulations. Uh, Yvette, it's a very nice uh, cover of the discovery. And then uh, Charles Steinhardt, uh, who is visiting, used to be, used to be here. Uh, where is Charles? Oh, he's over there. Uh, he's currently in Denmark, and he will talk about uh, the stellar mass function. So we'll start with Andrea. Please go ahead. Okay, go. Thank you, Avi. Thank you very much. Um, I've come to tell you about all the problems that we have. And I'm looking to you guys for suggestions and solutions. So the, as we said, the mystery continues. But we're also in a very unique room and place. Because this is the room where Harlow Shapley, more than a century ago, used to have his hollow square. And Harlow Shapley was the one who, in 1918, first used the Levitt Law and looked at the R.R. Library stars in globular clusters and determined the spatial distribution of these. And you see two nice little plots from his 1918 paper showing that, indeed, they're above and below the galactic plane. And then when you count numbers up, this is what you get. So he got the fundamental distribution right, and everything sort of comes from that, and uh, it still holds well and holds good, uh, holds good today. Um, now, we go back to sort of the 50s, the mid-50s, when first uh, Alan Sandage was the one who took both photoelectric um, measures as well as photographic plates to make uh, color magnitude diagrams of globular clusters. And you see on the left, here's M3. And then he then would continue and plot up a whole bunch of uh, uh, color magnitude diagrams showing the evolution of various stars. And so this was wonderful. Life was wonderful and simple. Um, we looked at these. The clusters are nice. They're easily isolated. You see them in clumps of cluster stars in the sky. Um, and so therefore, they must all have been formed at the same time. They must all be chemically homogeneous, uh, and they're wonderful examples of simple stellar evolution. Well, that's what we learned in school, and that's what I think many of you sitting out there also learned in school. <laughs> but life changed quite dramatically uh, in 1997 when a graduate student, actually, Jay Anderson, uh, looked at some of the um, engineering images of Omega Centauri that were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. And using these calibration and engineering images, he put in his thesis, he looked very carefully and decided that they're in the main sequence of, this is Omega Sen, uh, in the main sequence here, that he could actually see two main sequences. Not one, but two. And separated. And then he plotted them up up here. Actually, he just told me <laughs> very recently that his thesis advisor, Ivan King, said, you're crazy. That's not right. You're, you're really wrong. Uh, and he was horrified when a later conference put the, this particular image uh, on, on the cover because it was so consequential. Um, subsequently, uh, other, others have looked and looked with better data, and, and they see that there indeed there is a separated main sequence. And, and this was sort of horrifying because these are unevolved stars. Okay, and and there are two of uh, two 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 main sequences. So what is going on? And the first thing that came sequences. Uh, well, <laughs> you have to have hope and yeah. It, 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 it's 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 sort of here. You see the split right right okay. down and through here, right there. And then you can make a plot. You can do cross cuts, and you see that there's and there's more than that. I mean, the, the, the data get better. I mean, Hubble has had an enormous effect uh, on this in terms of determining photometry, photometrically color, mag color magnitude diagrams. And the first thing that the um, theorist said to us, oh, must be a helium abundance, that one has more helium than the other. Well, nobody actually measured the helium from a helium line directly 
until we did it a while back. And sure enough, we found this very weak um, helium line. This is the 10830 line. It's a metastable, well-known line in the sun, well-known in other luminous stars. And we found that, indeed, uh, the, the presence of this line, my little thing, the presence of the line indicated by the red dots, um, is in more sodium-enhanced, aluminum-enhanced, stars, which indicates that there must have been some kind of high temperature um, hydrogen burning going on in the star, which gives us a clue as to where these this uh, could come from. Okay, now this has gone on uh, exponentially. Actually, this 1997 is after the discovery of the first exoplanet, and we already have, I think, more papers <laughs> than you guys. <laughs> anyway, so now it's gotten very, very sophisticated. If you look at NGC 2808, uh, people are making, using photometry and developing um, uh, abundances and some spectroscopy, different, um, different bunches of clusters of stars in this sodium, I think it's sodium aluminum, um, uh, abundance, abundances. And they contend that certain groups are primordial, some are intermediate, some are extreme, uh, sort of formed at, at different times. And these are called chromosome maps. And uh, they are ex extremely uh, uh, complex. Uh, and you can see in this other figure here of N NGC 2808, people have found six or seven different bunches in these color color uh, diagrams, which are uh, so-called chromosome maps. So as you can imagine, there are lots of theories. Um, and I love this figure that comes from um, one of Nate Bastian's annual reviews, where he, he put out all the theories. Here are the theories along the top. No, excuse me. Yeah, well, here though, no, the theories are along the left. You know, d does this enhancement come from a the first flotsam and jetsam from AGB stars? Does it come from fast rotating massive stars that are spewing off material? Very super massive stars. Is there early disk accretion? As you can imagine, there's a whole uh, a variety of possibilities. And he then puts up along the top um, some of the uh, observational tests. You know, does the mass budget work? Uh, is there really a good helium spread? Uh, are there lithium correlations, et cetera, et cetera? And you can see uh, when the theory matches all the observations, he has a green check. And when it doesn't, he has a red cross. Well, <clears throat> you can just <laughs> look at that and see that uh, it's dominated more by red Xs. Uh, and these are all for what we call in situ formation. In other words, if you consider the globular cluster essentially by itself, uh, would any of these work? Well, we, there, there are no successes here, OK? Uh, later, there have been other things, like really supermassive stars from collisions in the core of a cluster, maybe 10 to the fifth solar masses, 10 to the fourth, rebounding molecular clouds and different differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. So clearly, when we look at the clusters in our own galaxy, there are problems. <laughs> it's a very confusing um, a situation that we see. So what do we do? Let's go somewhere more simple. Let's go to the large Magellanic Cloud. It's younger, so maybe we can capture these, um, these stars and these clusters uh, in a much younger age and try to figure out what's going on. Okay, so people have looked at many, and this is just one typical um, uh, color magnitude diagram that's made, again, with photometry. And we find something quite different. These are younger now. And so therefore, we're seeing a turnoff my little light's not working. I mean, we see what's called an extended main sequence turnoff. A lot of stars like this. Um, a lot of stars here. Um, and a lot of them are seen, seem to have um, H alpha emission. Now, this is using a narrow band filter uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, some of these guys didn't quite realize that when you have a narrow band filter and you have a high velocity cloud, or a high velocity cluster, you may not capture all the H alpha, right? So in other words, here's the, here's the filter, and here's where the emission line is. So you can see that these LMC clusters are way, way out here. They're moving back and forth. Uh, maybe you'll get it, maybe you won't. It's not really a good thing to do. You have to use spectroscopy. And that's what we did. So we went and took spectra, spectra um, of from uh, Las Campanas at, with M2MS or with Mike. And we found that many of these stars indeed do have uh, emission. Uh, this is an H alpha emission, which is indicative 
These are BE stars, so they're indicative of stars that are rotating rapidly, and they have what's called a disc excretion disk, a, a, a disk of material around the star producing this H-alpha emission. Um, other stars are rotating pretty rapidly, but don't seem to have the emission. In other words, on the left, we found some at, let's say, 70 kilometers, others at uh, much higher, 200 kilometers per second. And when we looked at a number of these stars, now this is spectroscopically, to find out where is the H-alpha emission indicating very rapid rotation, we find that the red circles indicating the emission tend to lie cooler to the right um, of, the, of the blue circles. Now these are faint stars, so we can't get a lot of them. <laughs> but what we find is that the um, rapidly rotating stars appear to be located cooler. So there's a... a, a a group of stars that are rapidly rotating and a group of stars that aren't rotating quite so rapidly. And when we think, we look at this and put various uh, MESA um, models against it, uh, we find that maybe there really is some age difference. These are two different uh, MESA models, um, including with rotation and without rotation. And even if we rotate them, we can't get the fan of spread of, of um, the observed uh, emission lines that we that we that we see. Okay, now some people have now suggested that maybe what's happening is that the stars are formed rapidly rotating, and then there's some kind of breaking mechanism, so that they start out rapidly rotating and then they move down and become less rapidly rotating. Well, we can look for signs of winds, and we've been trying to do that now by looking either at H alpha profiles, where you see sort of a 50 kilometer per second change. This thing is, doesn't really work. I put my batteries in. A 50 kilometers uh, per second change in the profile. Or one can look in particular at the um, helium-1 lines, which are very good for, for this, and see that if you reverse the profile, taking the blue, the red side and reverse it onto the blue side, you see more absorption generally on the blue side, indicating there's opacity there, there's outflow, and, and material is being absorbed, uh, absorbed in, the, in the wind. Okay, what's next? We have a lot of uh, data, we have a lot of questions, we still have a lot of problems, but we think there are ways forward. Um, First of all, it's interesting that only a quarter of the Milky Way globular clusters have really been analyzed uh, in any serious detail. We need to get the spectroscopy of low-mass stars. As you can tell, I'm a believer in spectroscopy because I think photometry can hide a lot of things. <laughs> um, astroseismology may be useful in some of these clusters, which we can now do with TESS or have done with Kepler. Um, we also need to look at other venues like dwarf galaxies um, and some of the uh, complex globulars that are in the uh, galactic bulge. And, of course, JWST, <laughs> the savior, may let us look at even younger clusters to try to sort out how these clusters happened to be the way they are. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Obvious possibilities. I'm sorry, I, I've got, I'm, I'm hearing noises here. Uh, two obvious possibilities to get multiple ages within a given cluster is if you have two clusters merging, like a collision of two clusters that form at different times, or every time they pass through the galactic disk, there is a, I mean, there is some gas that right. makes new stars. Uh, yeah. Which one seems more likely? <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to, I don't know where I'm going to put my bets <laughs> on that. It's like, will the Patriots win this weekend or not? I don't know. Um, the, the, uh you say yes, you pick up gas, but then one of the other problems is that gas has not been observed in these clusters. I mean, people think that maybe AGB stars put out this process material, which is what we see in terms of the helium and things. But first of all, there's not always enough AGB stars to produce the second generation of stars. And for a long time, people were looking for this gas in the clusters. And to my knowledge, they haven't found any gas in the clusters. But you raise this question of maybe it's a dwarf galaxy. And Omega Sen is one of the largest clusters in our galaxy. And people thought, yes, or think, maybe it is a dwarf galaxy. Well, 
We then looked at the abundances in dwarf galaxies. And dwarf galaxies have a real span of abundances, including some very metal poor stars. So we've tried to look for those uh, in Omega Sen. They're not there. We've looked a long time with Magellan <laughs> trying to get them and, and looking at the right stars because people like to look at the red giants because those are kind of fun and there are lots of them and things. Well, we went after the really, what should be the metal poor stars, couldn't find them. So in terms of, of does it have the distribution of abundances that you see in a dwarf galaxy, we can't find them. So I, I don't know. I mean, that's why it, it's, it's full of imaginative theoretical ideas. <laughs> but we're still, um, I guess, in the weeds of trying to figure out which one is, which one is right. So if you've got some ideas, let us know. And we'll, we'll try to continue along with and make more contributions than Shapley did. <laughs> Are there okay. any questions? Oh, oh go ahead. Uh, I'll probably suggest another idea. Uh, tell me uh, if it's possible or not. Uh, if the lower sequence is the single star sequence and the upper one is unresolved binaries and multiple stars. There, there's sequence. some thought that the upper ones may be binaries. But, but th th that hasn't, doesn't work out completely. Uh, I mean, nothing's 100%. <laughs> and that's why it was uh, Francesca D'Antona who's working now on ideas that, that maybe um, stars are formed with two sets of rotation parameters, maybe from the original cloud somehow. And, and there's some indication, I believe, from open clusters that you have in, in the young ones, you have a bifurcation of rotational velocities. And so maybe that happens. And that's why we're seeing the emission from these rapidly rotating ones. And then maybe eventually they become uh, sl slowed down um, fr from winds and loss of angular momentum and then move more to the, uh, you know, to, to the blue side. Of the of the color magnitude diagram, yeah. Oh, yeah, actually, to follow up on the question, how could it be that the string was originally binary, maybe they merged, and that's how they maybe get some of their rotation? That's been suggested too. <laughs> My understanding is that it it that might solve a certain part of the problem, but not all the problem. I mean. Uh, one problem is it, it's, there's what they call a mass deficit, that, that you want to produce this second generation, but you don't have enough material from the first generation to make the second generation. Um, and, and you see more, um, what do I want to say, discrepancies or, or enhancement of second to first generation in more massive clusters. So there are almost too many clues right now. <laughs> but we're trying to attack it bit by bit with spectroscopy. Well, it's good to know there are still uh, a lot of mysteries to be resolved, because that's uh, the reason the theories are getting paid, to explain those. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, much. thank you.
All right, so earlier I, I talked about uh, how planets form, and uh, one of the steps is the formation of planetesimals. So what's the best way to study that? So actually look at one up close, which we'll have to thank <coughs> the New Horizons uh, folks uh, for, for doing that for us. So uh, this talk started actually 4.5 billion years ago, but actually this one was uh, after the flyby of the, uh, the, the New Horizons <clears throat> past Pluto, which happened in 2015. And then after that, they were looking at what else the spacecraft could do. So they looked for stuff that would be on the path of New uh, uh, Horizons and then found out that there was one object uh, that uh, would be on the, uh, the tra trajectory. They discovered it in 2014, <clears throat> doing a, a campaign precisely for that, and that was uh, then found in 2014 on the path of New Horizons called uh, then MU69. As it got closed, this is what it saw. So there we go. You all saw that in the media, <clears throat> I suppose. It's a planetesimal. This is how a planetesimal looks like. Right? This is a cold classical Kuiper Belt object. That means these this bodies that are in very low in inclination and low uh, eccentricity orbit that never interacted with the giant planets. They were formed 4.5 billion years ago where they are and have, have never uh, interacted with bigger objects. They are in, in, in deep freeze since the, that time. So <clears throat> that's how a planetesimal looks like. Across is 33 kilometers, you see the first uh, lobe is like 20, the 20 kilometers, the other one 14. And the question, of course, how did this thing form? <laughs> like, like, when I looked at that, I was like, ah, how, how? <laughs> so this is the, the, uh, the cartoon image. So about 4.5 billion years ago, re remote blocks of ice and, uh, and rock got to, to, uh, together to form this, uh, these two lobes. And these two lobes formed as a, a binary that was not in contact, and then something happened to get them into contact. I'm going to focus on, on this 10 minutes on uh, the middle point. So once the two lobes are formed, how do they get into contact? How did this binary harden? Right? And, uh, well, the first thing that one would think of is the gas drag from uh, the nebula. Right? They form while the gas is there. So the lobe one and lobe two, they, they are orbiting in, in gas, and then they would lose uh, angular mo momentum due to, to drag, which sounds easy and simple, and you know you write down the, uh, the, uh, the equations. I am breaking one of my rules, which is to never show you the equations in a, a talk. Right? But <laughs> there you go. Uh, these ones are, are, uh, are simple in, in, enough. So, you have yeah gravity from the body, then the gas drag, and then uh, you have them this the solution for the the angular mo momentum. Like quite simple, it will uh, decay exponentially. The solution then would look like this: uh, the angular momentum of the body will decay exponentially with time, and then you can solve it for other quantities in the uh, the system too. The semi-major axis, right, of the uh, the the body will also decay exponentially. And then there is also an exponential increase, of course, of the orbital speed as the semi-major axis decays. And contact would happen here in, in this, this line. That's when you bring the semi-major axis down to less than the, the radius of the, uh, the bodies. Every, all of that looked good, except that when you work out the numbers, these bodies are so small that the gas drag would take too long uh, to, uh, to operate. Um, sorry, I mean, like, they're big so, so that their, their, uh, their aerodynamical properties, right, would make the, uh, the drag time be too large. So the drag time is about 100 million years. That just won't won't work. So it's a good idea that, that um, turned out to, to not actually work too well. But we can work it out uh, uh, variations of this uh, idea. It's not just the drag. There is also a wind coming from the, uh, the disk because these orbits, uh, uh, sorry, these bodies are orbiting with a, a Keplerian speed, but the gas it itself orbits sub-Keplerian. So you have a, a, a wind which is of about 50 meters per second. These winds will give you extra, extra drag. 
So you can then work out what the uh, the orbits and would uh, would would uh, would uh, behave uh, when you have this drag, right? How would the wind so solution change if on top of drag you also have uh, a, a wind? All right, so I'll work it out here, and this is what it looks like. So the semi-major axis actually doesn't change by, by that much. The energy doesn't change much because it turns out that, that what energy it gains, um, uh, sorry, uh, what energy it loses on one side of the, uh, the orbit, it will gain back on the, uh, the other one, right? However, the eccentricity starts to go up quite, quite, uh, quite fast, and angular momentum once again goes down. Uh, the orbit ends up looking like this, right? So you start from a circular orbit, and then eventually uh, it will flatten, right? So you lose uh, angular momentum, but at constant energy. So the orbit goes from a, a circular orbit to then um, uh, a line, and that's when the bodies merge. So this seemed to be, again, nice. Uh, seemed that it were on the... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the right track, but again, the devil lies in the details. So the wind has a strong effect on only at the distances of the asteroid belt. This is what you have here for winds uh, of different speeds. So zero meters per second, that means no wind, and uh, going then from one meter per second, 10 meters per second, 50, and uh, 100. The typical pressure gr gradient in the disk will give you the red line. So you can decrease the, uh, the, uh, the drag time from 100 million years, which is what you, you would have without any wind, to about uh, 1 million years or less, which is much better to co collapse uh, the bodies in uh, the, uh, the lifetime of the disk. So that works for about 10 AU but not much at the distance of the Kuiper belt. And the reason is because it, the drag force in the, uh, the asteroid belt is different than in uh, the Kuiper belt because the Reynolds numbers are different. One of them is in the linear regime. The other one is in uh, the qu quadratic re regime. The asteroid belt is in the, uh, the qu quadratic re regime. Uh, the Kuiper belt is more in the, uh, the linear. And, and Arokov lies in the middle between them. So the drag by itself, even with the, the wind, it gets close, but not quite. So we need to see what else is happening here. So these are models that I ran then. I was trying to find out how to, to make those, those two bodies com collapse. And until I realized that they have a non-zero inclination, and then, you know, let's see what the effect of inclination will be. So there are a lot of plots here. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. I only want you to focus on the, on the difference here between zero inclination and 60 inclination, right? And specifically here, then on the 60, what is happening here on these two cases? So you have the inclination and you have the eccentricity, right? So it seems that you start the bodies from any inclination here in this, uh, this range. They will go up and down. And the eccentricity is doing the opposite, going down and up. Or have you seen that before? Because I lead of oscillations. So it seems that that is what's happening here. Even without any gas drag, because I lead of oscillations will be happening there, which, uh, which makes uh, sense uh, whenever you have uh, eccentricity and inclination. Uh, you can uh, exchange them be, uh, beyond uh, a critical inclination of uh, the orbit, which indeed we are in, in this range. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that was for 60, right? At, uh, at 90, this is what it looks like here. You have the, the, uh, the semi-major axis, right, is doing this, this decay. And you have these other uh, things on, on top of it here. You have uh, uh, the angular mo momentum here going down, again, with the eccentricity going up. So I implemented this in a, a model with cosi, tidal friction, and, and drag. Um, so uh, the model is on, on GitHub. You can uh, download it. So um, this is, these are the plots that you get. So this is what happens if you don't have anything, right? Just, just the, the, the cosi. This line here is uh, the classical line that you would expect from cosi. And these are different models. The green ones are the models where there was contact, and the open ones are models that didn't. So it reproduces quite well uh, what cosi does, right? 
Once you start adding more stuff to the model, you see where contact happens and where contact doesn't happen. So in this one, I added the tides that the body induces on each other, uh, seeing that, that nothing changes. The J2 uh, component of the gravitational field, that's when the interesting things start uh, to happen. And then you can have some uh, regions here that uh, did not have contact on uh, the classical cosi, but now they do. Still, this region here is quite uh, narrow, but actually when you add on top of it gas drag, then you start having more contact, like more regions here where you can have a contact, right? So the conclusion then is that, uh, yeah, so the fact of a drag has a major, uh, 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 well, I mean, ha has a major effect here to bring the bodies to contact. Contact happens here in this line, right? Uh, the full model is uh, the red model, right? When you have uh, the, uh, the tides, the J2 plus the gas ring. So when you include everything, you can, you can achieve contact, which is some, something that if you include only one particular effect, you will not, uh, not have. So it's a, a synergy of gas rag and J2 that leads to, to contacts. So I will leave the conclusions here, and I'll open for questions now if I have any. Thank you. In the outer solar system, there were there was migration, right? That's That's correct. In the Kuiper Belt region, so mm -hmm. it's possible this rock was made somewhere else, right? And migrated. So, in in the Nice model, where would like the present location, right? Where would it be relative right. to the initial location? So yeah. Uh, so the question is. Uh, Migration, right? Uh, we know that the bodies, once they form, uh, they start exchanging angular mo momentum with the uh, the disk. So could it could it be that it, it it happened here? So these bodies are too small, right? So uh, so migration will happen once you you have way more mass than this, right? Um, even bodies of the mass of the moon do not migrate much, like for type one migration. Right. Oh, the planets. Of, ah, right. Okay. The so, planets. yeah, the planets. The planets, indeed. Yeah, they migrate too. They can migrate inwards and they can migrate outwards. So, Neptune right now is uh, at 30 AU, right? The Nice model assumes a compact configuration for the the origin of the giant planets, and then in that model, Neptune actually formed much closer than what it is now. So, it migrated from a about like 15 AU to, to where it is now. Okay, so there is some, yeah. yeah. It's only a factor of two years. Yeah. Okay. Um, no? So when I look at the image of, of, of this object, there's a very pronounced neck between the two lobes. Right. Uh, uh, and is that an artificial consequence of the way the data are processed? Or is it real? And if it's real, how does the neck fall? No, yeah, it is real, yeah. And in fact, this neck gives you a constraint of uh, how how gentle this uh, this co collision had uh, to happen, given the uh, the tensile strength uh, of this object should not break the neck completely. The contact must have happened at less than two meters per second. That's a human walking uh, speed. So, uh, yeah. It's not chemical, it's gravity. Awesome. It's gravity, yeah. Any other questions? Let's think of the reason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
All right. Uh, Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to talk about this today because this paper just finally got out in the journal and is obviously it was in the Harvard Gazette. And I have to actually start with an apology for everyone because if you tried to access the CFA website yesterday afternoon, it was down because we got into a very illustrious journal, the front page of Reddit. So probably about <laughs> you laugh, but more people have seen this than they read your archive papers. Like there were definitely like a million people who saw this minimum. Uh, so it was very exciting, but you know, the public loves black holes, and I'm here to tell you guys a bit more of the science about what exactly we saw and what is happening with this uh, black hole. So what are tidal disruption events, just so we're all on the same page? A TDE occurs when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole and gets torn apart by the tidal forces uh, present around that supermassive black hole. Uh, there's a lot of implications for why we study these TDEs, things like relativistic jets. About 1% of all TDEs appear to launch a relativistic jet. There's other outflows, potential multi-messenger physics, all sorts of interesting things that transient astronomers are interested in. To date, there's about 100 TDEs that have been reported. Most of them, though, what we're doing in particular is we look in optical, classify them in optical, and then we're following up in the radio uh, in order to basically trace the outflows post-disruption and see what's going on. The reason we're interested in what we're doing in the radio is we're basically looking at the synchrotron emission that comes from these sources. So we do multi-frequencies from, say, 1 to 100 gigahertz, something like that, getting these uh, spectral breaks in the spectrum, which are well known from gamma ray burst physics. And what you're doing then with that information is you're inferring a lot of the physical properties of the system. So things like its radius, thus its velocity, the energy, the density of material you're plowing into, and some things also about the shops, shock physics, so such as the electron emissivity, uh, things like that, basically are what we're doing in the radio and why we're interested in the radio observations of these outflows. Now, what's been interesting about TDEs in the last couple of years, so most radio observations, as I said, you look, see optical, follow up, within the first two months, about 20% of them you'll see turn on in the radio when you do this with something like the VLA. Uh, but after that, unfortunately, radio telescope time is precious, so we're going to go look at other things, and usually people have kind of left it uh, at that point. However, recently there's been two TDEs that have been published in the literature that became radio bright after 100 days. So Assassin 15OI, IPTF 16 FNL are their names. And then the question is obviously, is this common? Are we missing something that's going on in the TDE population? So in order to find out, what we ended up doing is we searched in a uh, very large array sky survey, and we did a dedicated campaign with the VLA and the Meerkat in South Africa with about two dozen older TDEs, most are about two to three years old, to see what we see. I'm going to tell you guys about one of these very uh, exciting objects. So first to set the scene, what we've got here are a bunch of different uh, radio detected TDEs. At the top, we have the jetted TDE Swift J1644 plus 57, as you see, much more luminous. Uh, we have a normal TDE in the yellow, AT2019 GSG. So this is just a TDE detected at early times, the outflow as you see it progress. Uh, this down here is IPTF16 FNL. Uh, but the one up here that's kind of is blue is the Assassin 15 OI uh, TDE. Now I'm going to add our new one into the mix. So AT2018HYZ is this guy, and it's doing something we've never seen before. So what you see here, these triangles are upper limits, and then you see it's rising as T to the fifth. We first detected it June 2021. If you're speaking in radio, it was 1.3 millijanskis at 5 gigahertz, so that's like a pretty decently bright radio source. Uh, we actually had, a, this is not on this plot, but unpublished last month, it was about 10 millijanskis. So it's rising very quickly uh, in the radio. And as you see, it's now even more bright or more luminous than Assassin 15 OI. I should note Assassin 15 OI, that data point is just a single frequency observation from the VLA Sky Survey. So we don't have the physical parameters from that uh, detection for what's going on. But anyway, so you do a lot of DDTs, a lot of monitoring with different radio telescopes. And you can see it's really rising very rapidly in all the frequencies. You could ask me what's with this turnover here. The last observation that we had in this paper was a uh, Meerkat plus ATCA observation. We think there's a calibration error now that we've been looking at that data since what made it into the paper. Uh, so that's probably going to change a little bit over time just to explain what's going on. We also got a lot of multi-frequency observations, in particular a Chandra DDT, because obviously radio and X-ray are often coupled. So we're interested in what the X-ray picture is. 
There were, when this TDE was first discovered, uh, some low luminosity X-rays uh, associated uh, in that area, so it was probably some low uh, luminosity AGN activity. The Chandra data, though, it's within a factor of two of what it was when this initial TDE was discovered. So you're not seeing an associated giant flare or something like that. We also have SWIFT, so we see a UV optical excess uh, going on in this from what you'd expect from the models. Uh, that's not too uncommon in TDEs. And you do also have a slight, uh, the red data point there is ZTF from about January of this year, just going into the ZTF data. Uh, there is an excess there, but it's not really like a smoking gun excess. You wouldn't really notice this unless you had the radio observations to see what is going on. I should also note at this point, we don't think this is caused by a second, D, uh, second TD, like another star that came in or something like that because none of, the, none of the optical surveys picked up on anything uh, while this event was on going. So anyway, we have all these nice observations over time. So what we can do, uh, based off of these are the VLA data points, as I said, this is a bit of a calibration er uh, issue, we think. But you can fit what you can fit uh, and see what sort of properties you have. We have two models we considered. So first, you're considering a sphere going out in all directions, or you have a jet, so we assume 10 degrees, similar to what you see in GRBs. Just because this is a point source, we can't actually resolve it. And uh, we get some pretty interesting results. So the first result is the max outflow velocity, if it's spherical, is about beta of 0.2. Uh, if you have a jet, though, it's a beta of 0.6. So you're getting into this mildly relativistic regime, which is very, very interesting. You can then, of course, fit a line and go back, extrapolate, and you get about 750 days post-disruption is when this outflow would have started going outward. It's also consistent with the last upper limit we had from the Very Large Array Sky Survey, which occurred about nine months before uh, our first detection of the source, just serendipitously, but it is all uh, pretty consistent there. We can also, as I said, look at the energy and velocity of the outflow. So on this plot, we have on the x-axis, we have velocity, energy, uh, in the lower corner here, the lower left corner where all those other TDEs are, that's just the maximum energy that all those radio detected TDEs uh, were detected at. Uh, and up here, this is SWIFT J1644 plus 57, that very well studied jetted TDE event. I should note over time it's going to the left. People always instinctively think it's going to the right. That's not what's happening. It's slowing down over time. And anyway, what you can see is regardless of which model you take, uh, AT 2018 HYZ is somewhere in the middle here. It's uh, in this mildly relativistic regime, as I said. And it's very exciting because right now, as I said, majority of TDEs live down in that space. That's similar to what you think for our supernova explosions, things like that. Up here is more similar to gamma ray bursts. And so it's really kind of filling in this, uh, pr previously we had this huge dichotomy in TDE physics on what is going on with these outflows. Um, so another thing you could ask me, though, is so like, okay, we're starting to think what is causing this guy. So we can look at the density profile of various TDEs. So radius here, we're adjusting for a short child radius because, of course, supermassive black holes can have very different sizes, so you kind of have to adjust. And then we're talking about the density of various TDEs and also two, t uh, two galaxies that are not TDE galaxies, but we know very well. So Sag A star and M87. And what you can see, though, is it's not like, for example, there's a wall of material that this suddenly the shockwave is slamming into and it's lighting up in radio, for example. The density profile here is pretty low uh, by every metric, so that doesn't really explain what we're seeing. Um, also, I think it was on an Eros. I should say a lot of people ask at this point, could it maybe be an off-axis jet that we're seeing just from a different angle and that light is now reaching us? The answer is no, you can calculate how soon that should happen. This happens too late, and also it's rising too quickly. Remember, t to the fifth, that's actually very hard to explain uh, in this context. So this has all been wonderfully exciting, and as I said, we got this press release out. Everybody seems to really excited. But as I said, there's you know one of about two dozen TDEs that we had in this sample. So then the next question is, OK, what did we find in the rest of them? So this is the plot that I had earlier uh, for luminosity, just this time I'm cutting out SWIFT J1644 plus 57. So here's what we had earlier on that plot. And now I'm going to add in the rest of the survey. We actually have six other TDEs that we detected in radio that did not have detections at earlier times uh, from that sample. None of them are as extreme as AT2018 HYZ, mm -hmm. but they're all rising. Uh, we all, I think all except one, we have an upper limit at earlier times, so we can somewhat constrain at what time they started. 
we do have multi-frequency data for all of these. We, they all have SEDs. They look very fantastic and interesting. And uh, I'm just going to conclude with a concluding thought here, which is just that, you know, we really stopped looking too early uh, at TDs. And the real excitement is, turns out, beginning years after the initial event. And I'm very excited to see what happens next. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Two questions. Um, one, um, you can imagine a stream stream collisions or a stream coming back and feeding it. The question is whether it's fast enough. Mm -hmm. And the second is that people talk nowadays about uh, changing loop AGN. And could this be related? Yeah, so those are both great questions. Uh, yeah, because what is going on is a bit of a mystery. We did for first the stream coming back. Basically, the mass associated with those is so low that we don't think that's what's happening at this point. Um, I, it is, of course, a possibility. But then you'd also have to assume this is just a common thing that happens in TDs. And TD physicists, uh, I don't think, really considered that. The second question was changing look AGNs. I mean, it's definitely possible. And that was actually changing look AGNs have a density profile change is the thought as well associated with them. So right now, because the density that we're measuring at this point is so low, it's not an immediate obvious connection. So n never say never, of course, when you have no idea what's going on. But it's not obvious. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I think it's you know something like a state change. Like we see those in X-ray binaries. There's a possibility there. There's also you know several other ideas. So let's see what else. Yeah. The stream thing, we kind of, we're very good at ruling out what it isn't and not really saying what it is. Um, yeah, because you theorists, you need to run your models longer. Most of them stop after a few weeks, and this is a lot. There's also maybe the jet somehow is choked at the beginning, and then it comes out. There's also possibilities like that. The star was not completely disrupted, so it comes back. Yes, so there is some evidence for that. As I said, the problem there is you would have seen something in optical, right? Like, or presumably you would have. And we don't really see that happening, so it's tough. Very interesting. Yeah. Ramesh, any comments? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, what are the black hole masses, right? Mm -hmm. Are they all over the map, or are these homogeneous uh, subset? That's a good question because uh, I haven't looked at those specific numbers in a while. I mean, they're all supermassive black holes, you know, um, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the, <laughs> 10 to the 6, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 7, I want to say. Yeah, I mean, if they're much bigger than that, the tidal radius is within the event horizon, so, yeah. are really much smaller than the heading, right? Yes. We're talking about, I don't know, 8, 7 or something. Yeah, so the, the question, that, so you know, you can imagine like if you're thinking of m dot, you also see these outflows at earlier times. So how are you going to explain m dot that's really high and m dot that's low? It gets to be a little tricky. So. Well, the radiative efficiency may be small. That's, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. But Avi, I think this is only the radio luminosity. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. This is not the volumetric luminosity. What is the volumetric? I don't know. <laughs> We're still working on that. Uh, yeah, but it's sort of the tail of the dog. If you are saying that it's a heading dog, this is nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Please go ahead. With the question. Um, so, because um, they're talking about the star potentially coming back around, could you have dust that kind of masks the optical? And then so there is a chance. Like we don't really understand right now. You know we're somewhat selective in our sample. These are all, I should emphasize, also TDEs that did not have radio emission associated with them because radio AGN are very easily contaminating your sample pool otherwise. So there is definitely the possibility, like the jet is choked or something and then it breaks out. But uh, right now, it's just we don't have enough data <laughs> to really say for sure. But also three years for the break. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very strange length of time. That's really what it is. Like, yeah. Yeah, a quick comment regarding your question on the, uh, this time scale. So, uh, in principle, from what I remember, most of these TDEs are around low mass black holes, like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, yeah. you know, like 10 to the 9. And so, if you make, if you crunch the numbers basically, or 10 to the 6, uh, the Eddington rate, uh, the Eddington accretion rate for one solar mass should sustain for 20 years. To basically, uh, so basically, one star can feed an AGN if you assume that this is a mechanism for 20 years at the Eddington limit, and we don't see this. 
Yeah. What do you mean you don't see? I, I mean, we don't see the age, uh, the adding to limited. Uh, no, they're super. Age, usually, yeah. they're, they're usually super adding to the event. When the event happens, yes, but not later. No. Like, yeah. We, we haven't seen these cases yet. I should also, we, uh, this is about a tenth of the solar mass uh, for the star because when it first happened, it was an in house TD. Sebastian actually is the one who found it, and um, he ran all the models and told me it was about a tenth of a star, uh, solar mass. Yeah. So this is a real, a real puzzle for theorists to figure out. Yes, I, uh, I encourage you to figure this out for me because I don't know. <laughs> yes, um, so there's the, you're saying that this, like, that it's raising, rising in the luminosity with radio, um, like, two, three years later. Is there, like, observations between the two, three years later and the, like, zero? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I'll just go back to the light curve we got real quick. Ah, it's gone. No, uh, come back. There we are. Okay, so yeah, we had these initial observations here. So one of those is 15 gigahertz, one is like uh, 100 gigahertz. We do have this gap here. So it is interesting. We see in this one there was some initial outflow and then it started going up. So we might have missed some initial outflow just because of the sampling. And this is VLA Sky Survey. So we were basically very lucky with the timing of the VLA Sky Survey uh, for this one. Fortunately, none of the other ones were quite as perfect uh, for the timing. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And we're, we're definitely a little, a little more systematic, I should say, in radio TDs, like there's a VLA large program now, so the sampling is definitely going to be better going ahead, but it's going to be interesting to watch those guys in the coming next few years as well uh, for what happens. It's an interesting paper just published about supernovae that the star produces a lot of dust, gets very dim uh, a few weeks or months oh, before all, the explosion, yeah. and uh, it, in a way it gives us a timer. So mm -hmm. perhaps this would also be a timer for something. Yes, know? maybe. Um, With redshift for the day. Yes. So they should just give me all the radio time so we can <laughs> monitor all these <laughs> and uh, keep an Thank eye on them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, because it's your call. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. So, so I wanted to tell you, I guess, just a, a little bit about some of the highlights of work we've been doing for the past few years. Uh, to see whether we can measure the stellar initial mass function from large photometric surveys. And really this is at the core of everything that we learn about uh, distant galaxies. Because the light's coming from just the high mass tail of the stellar population, whereas if we're interested in things like stellar mass or star formation rate or anything that's covariant with those, we need some assumption about the initial mass function. And even within our own galaxy, this is one of the historically difficult problems in galactic astronomy with, with many different proposed IMFs, and at least three of these are still in common use in extragalactic astronomy. Okay? But still, because we don't have the ability to measure this directly, typically what we end up doing is just picking our favorite version of a Milky Way IMF, and then assuming that we can use that IMF at all times and under all conditions when we analyze other galaxies. And the problem is there are several good reasons to think that this really should not be true. So first off, if we change the conditions in, in star-forming regions, so for example, what happens when we change the temperature? For, say, a Krupa IMF is we change the IMF. That as we go toward higher temperature, we end up getting a bottom lighter or top heavier, whichever way you want to think about it, IMF, so that we're going to get a greater fraction of high-mass stars, a lower mass-to-light ratio, Right? And so if the temperature ends up not being the same as in Milky Way star forming regions, then we know that we really need to use a different IMF. And at least if we look at something like dust temperatures, there are already hints that that should be the case. Because if we look at dust temperatures, for example, from, from the Cosmos survey that I'm going to show you results from a little bit later, if we look at dust temperatures, we see that first off at fixed redshift, there are a variety of different dust temperatures. 
that as we go toward higher specific star formation rates, sort of toward the top left, that the dust temperature goes up. And similarly, that as we go toward higher redshift, that under the same conditions, we end up at higher temperatures. So, so we might imagine that the same ought to be true for conditions in star forming regions and for gas temperatures, even if we can't measure them directly, right? Now, there are a bunch of caveats here. They may not be in equilibrium. This is a luminosity average dust temperature. I could probably fill the next 10 minutes with caveats about this. Um, but maybe what I could say, actually, which would be more incontrovertible, is that now we're thinking about the era of doing this with Webb. If you do this at a redshift of 10, the CMB temperature is 30 Kelvin, whereas star forming regions in the Milky Way should be more like 18 to 20 Kelvin. So at least in, in the era of Webb and thinking about the most distant galaxies we're finding, we really know that something different should be happening and that we should not be using a Milky Way based IMF. Okay, but what can we do instead? So currently what we tend to do with large photometric surveys is we try some kind of template fitting approach where we take a bunch of synthetic photometry, maybe, sorry, synthetic spectra, maybe produced by something like Charlie Conroy's code uh, under a variety of different conditions, different assumptions, different star formation histories, metallicity, extinction, and so forth. And we just try to figure out which one fits the photometry best and infer the properties from that fit. So the approach we're taking is just to add an additional parameter, try changing the gas temperature for each of these, and for each of these, get a few different IMFs and see how the spectrum changes. Okay? And for some templates like this blue star forming one, it's a larger effect than it is for a quiescent one. Uh, that makes sense simply because there are more high mass stars in, in, in the star forming one. But in any event, if everything goes well, what you end up doing is just being able to find some best fit and, okay, that's the gas temperature and the IMF that we're going to infer. Um, this is much harder than I'm making it sound, primarily because the changes that we're getting are highly covariant with changes in extinction, metallicity, and several other things. But it turns out that we're now at the point that with a survey like Cosmos, where we have 30 photometric bands, we have over a million objects, that at least for about the 5% best measured objects in Cosmos, it seems like we can get a meaningful constraint and something that appears to be a best fit. So, okay, we get some fit. Uh, is it meaningful? Well, maybe one way we can ask this question is to just do the direct comparison with the dust temperatures. So at the top, what, what I'm showing you are the gas temperatures that we get from these fits, kind of inferring it from which IMF was the best fit, and just kind of comparing it against the, the dust temperatures that I showed you earlier at the same redshift. And this is actually kind of striking, that, that not just qualitatively do we get the same answer, that, that towards high redshift things are becoming a little bit higher temperature, and in each one of these panels at fixed redshift, as we go to the top left, toward higher specific star formation rate, we get higher temperature. But even quantitatively, there seems to be pretty good agreement. You know, despite both of these techniques having significant different systematic potential errors, different kinds of uncertainties, measuring things in different parts of the spectrum, different uh, not well justified assumptions that go in them, we actually get remarkably good agreement that suggests that we might be actually getting a meaningful fit here. And what I want to do in the remaining time is just mention a couple of places where when you change the IMF, we actually get a little bit different pictures from things we thought we might have understood about galaxy evolution. So, so one example is when we think about quenching and, the, and how galaxies turn off. So what I'm showing you here are stellar mass functions just from the same Cosmos catalog but all generated using, you know, whichever Milky Way IMF. I think this one's a Chabrier IMF, but you get the same kind of answer as long as you pick one consistent Milky Way IMF. So at the top, what you're seeing are star-forming stellar mass functions, and below that, uh, the same thing for quiescent galaxies. Uh, what I want you to pay attention to here is the fraction of galaxies that are quiescent at these different redshifts. And at the very low redshift end, which in this figure is actually uh, redder here, right? the very low redshift end, what we see is that the highest mass galaxies have quenched. They're now quiescent. 
the lowest mass galaxies continue to form stars, and there's some transition mass in the middle, right? So that essentially it looks as if, you know, quenching is just the end process of having formed all of your stars for a while. Maybe some kind of gas depletion mechanism or something like that. But as we go toward higher redshift, right, this blue and purple, we actually get a different story. It seems like at high redshift, the first things that quench aren't actually the most massive ones, but, but they're somewhere in the middle of the distribution. And it's not all of them that have quenched, but only some of them. And that's more puzzling, right? Except now if we go ahead and fit IMFs, right? Well, remember that what we saw was that as you go toward higher specific star formation rates, we're getting a higher temperature and therefore a lower mass to light ratio. And so for all of these star forming galaxies, the masses get, the masses get pushed down and everything gets pushed to the left. Whereas for the quiescent galaxies, it doesn't get pushed to the left as far. It has a more Milky Way like IMF and therefore the stellar masses don't really change. And so if we now look at the ratio, we actually get the same answer at every redshift. It just looks like the most massive ones have turned off. The least massive ones continue to form stars. And there's some transition mass which decreases toward low redshift. Okay. Finally, what I, what I want to show you is kind of an attempt to take these gas temperatures and make something like an HR diagram, but for galaxies. So in an HR diagram, we're comparing a temperature with a luminosity, so some kind of efficiency of taking mass and undergoing fusion. Here, we're going to compare this with a specific star formation rate, so the gas temperature against the efficiency of, of kind of making stars. And just like the HR diagram, your, your eye is maybe drawn a little bit to the, to the wings of the distribution, but you get what looks like a sequence from top right to bottom left, where galaxies go up in stellar mass, go up in the age of the stellar population, uh, move toward lower redshift. Right, so, so most galaxies are in the top left corner here, if you look at the contours. These are your typical star-forming galaxies. And the ones in the bottom left, those are quiescent galaxies at very low specific star formation rate. Uh, but the puzzle here is what's going on in the top right corner, what seems to be kind of the earliest stage of evolution of a typical galaxy, where somehow we're able to sustain star formation rate at a much higher temperature than typical galaxies. So the, the best idea that, that we had come up with for this <coughs> is that maybe this is possible at very high density. So maybe this is why the central region of the Milky Way, for example, has an older stellar population, is because you can only form stars at these high temperatures in these dense central regions. And so what I'll leave you with is we, we actually have two ways of checking this. Okay? One is that in Cosmos we actually have Hubble imaging. Uh, for some of these. So here's what the morphology of some of these look like. These are all around a redshift of 0.8. So, so here the same angular scale corresponds to the same physical radius. At the top are these core forming galaxies at top right. The, the middle panel consists of just typical main sequence star forming galaxies and then the bottom quiescent ones. And it really seems to be consistent with this picture that what's happening in the top right corner here really is some kind of core formation phase where then you have older cores, and it's a disk formation phase on the main sequence, and finally quiescence. Um, and since it's worth mentioning the computational side here too, I'll mention that we're now working with John Forbes, who has a 1D uh, galaxy code called Gidget. And it turns out that under reasonable assumptions, you can get the same thing out of the simulations as well where you'll see that kind of early on you get kind of this core formation and just kind of a blue core. Then here you have something like this, this disk forming phase that would be the star forming main sequence. And then of course, finally quiescence. So yeah, let me thank you and uh, take some questions. So Charles, uh, an obvious uh, second parameter would be metallicity. People talked about the IMF being sensitive to that. It also affects the temperature, but you could think of metallicity as an independent parameter. Uh, is that the secondary opinion, like less important? That, that's a really good question. And I would really like to be able to kind of, so, so one of the issues here is that we're barely at the point that we can add one parameter 
Uh, and so we're essentially adding one parameter that's something like a speed of sound during fragmentation and trying to interpret that as a temperature. But, but really, as you point out, it's going to be a combination of temperature, metallicity, density, and, and several other things. Um, there, there are some simulations that suggest that maybe the metallicity and temperature might be linked. Uh, so, so it might be the case that this one parameter that, that I'm labeling temperature really is a degenerate combination of a few of these. And, and with that in mind, I can mention that there have been other attempts to, to kind of look at this relation between temperature and the IMF in addition to the one Adam Germain has that, that we're using. And they all kind of get the same qualitative answer that, you know, that in terms of getting a bottom lighter IMF, but actually trying to get a, a quantitative temperature out of this. I'm yeah, like to keep in mind it reaches 10. The microwave background is 30 degrees. Yeah. And that means you will have a flaw of temperature. You wouldn't have anything colder than the microwave background. So that's something to keep in mind. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, have you thought about a slightly different approach to the IMF variations, which you probably cannot use at these redshifts, but at slightly lower, like 0.1? Uh, generally, the if you think about top heavy IMF, it would produce many more massive stars. So you would expect uh, HMSPs to produce more X-rays. And so if you compare uh, perhaps X-ray versus H-alpha star formation, there, there might be differences due to the IMF. Of course, this is again, as Avi said, all the metallicity also can, can play the role. But you know, we know that this effect exists in, at all ages. Because in global clusters, if you look uh, in core collapse clusters where the uh, densities are very high, then you have, um, if you imagine that the source, <laughs> that you have top heavy IMF, you'll have more, uh, just more uh, okay. stellar remnants. And there will be an excess of low mass x ray binaries. But in star forming regions, you might have excess of uh, high mass x ray binaries because of top heavy IMF. That, so, so we haven't tried that, but that, that does sound like a really good approach. And uh, I mean, I'm trying. I'm trying to think about whether there's any technical reason. Well, no, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Well, maybe after the yeah. lunch, you can both. Yeah, and I think the question because we are over time. Go ahead. So, uh, you what you're saying is that you identify a temperature and then you scale your IMF compared to that. So here you list a few theoretical models, but the exponent of that temperature goes from linear to 5, five, five yes. over 2. So that's a pretty big range for, for us, for even for like factors of 3 temperature deviations. Not to mention that if you actually look at these models, then they actually depend on other parameters, which likely also vary. Yeah. And the third of all, if you just took this as it is temperature only and applied it to the Milky Way, you would get a much more varied IMF than we actually have in the Milky Way. So. Could you comment on that, or any plans of including other parameters? Okay. So, so first off, yeah, th this is this is certainly uh, going to be a really significant dependence, right? So, what we've come to find from do I have? I'm trying to see if I have that here. Do I have one of these? Uh, that's probably the wrong one. Okay. Well, what what, what, we, what we've come what we've come to find? Sorry about that. What we've, what we've come to find is basically that. What we're really fitting from kind of taking synthetic, taking synthetic spectra, producing photometry, and trying to figure out what we can recover. What we found that we really end up being sensitive to is, the, is a high mass break in the, in the existing stellar population, which we, and that, that's kind of the thing that we're able to fit from photometry. And then we're then making two optimistic assumptions on top of that. Right. First, that that break can be interpreted as being due to a break in the IMF and not, for example, some kind of end of starburst phase or something else in the star formation history. And then second, we're kind of taking that and again trying to optimistically convert it to a gas temperature. So something like this diagram, if it turns out that, that we're incorrectly converting to a gas temperature, you're still going to get the same story and you're still going to get the same kind of evolutionary tracks. But when you try to actually fit this to models and, and put some physics in it, you'd find that we got the temperatures wrong, right? Um, but on the other hand, I think qualitatively getting a diagram like this, you know, I, think, I, I guess what I'd say is there, there are two reasons that I think uh, something physically meaningful does seem to be coming out of this, 
right? One is that when we do this comparison with dust temperatures, which have entirely different kinds of systematics, we get the same story, right? And there's no reason that that would have had to happen randomly. And the other is that we make a diagram like this, which is done entirely from photometric template fitting and entirely from thinking about properties and trying to make a sequence, it also ends up being a morphological sequence. Because we are over time, let's thank all of our speakers. <laughs>